Okay, got that. Are you ready to start? Uh, yeah, I'm good. Okay, well, welcome to the SEMC Winter EM course. Today's guest lecture is Bill Rice coming from New York University. He's from, uh, I guess, not only the Department of Cell Biology, but the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Pharmacology. And he's also the core director of the NYU Langone Cryo-EM Center. So Bill's gonna to talk to us about microEDD and 2D crystallography. So please take it away. Oh, thanks, Ed. Um, seem to have trouble, for some reason, my slideshow isn't starting. <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm shared before I started it. I'm gonna be... Or do you wanna start it and then yeah, stop screen share, then start it and then go through Exactly, it. yeah. It has its own point. logic. <laughs> yeah, let's see. No, it doesn't want to start. I don't know why. That's so strange. Um, hmm. I'm not sure why this slide. Well, hopefully, let's let me, let me share it again. I, you should be able to see it. It's just uh, won't be quite as big, but I think it should be okay. It's and a it's a Windows order, computer. The PDFs are on the website now. So okay. if you want to see the slides, you can also go to our website. It's strange. I'm not sure why it's not sharing it, why it's not starting the show, but uh, anyway. I don't, know the, I don't know the shortcut for screen share either. Well, it's sharing. Yeah. It just, anyway, maybe I can make this. Is it possible to move this over? No. Well, can you see it okay? I, I can see it. And worst comes to worst, the, the full PDF slide deck is also on our website. Okay, yeah, so apologies for this. I didn't know it's a new computer. It's a different computer, and um, looks like it's not PowerPoint's not happy showing a slideshow for some reason. But uh, so I'll get going now. So I'm going to talk today about uh, micro ED and 2D crystallography. 2D crystallography first, and then micro ED. Um, so um, there are, I guess, four main modalities you'll be learning about during this course in Cryo EM. Uh, there's tomography, um, single particle reconstruction, um, 2D electron crystallography, and, and micro ED, uh, ED standing for mic electron diffraction. So um, micro ED actually gives the top resolution of any of these techniques. It can give actually sub angstrom resolution reconstructions of, of molecules. Um, second best and you know, rapidly closing in, I think, is single particle reconstruction, which is already at around 1.1 angstrom, which is kind of incredible. Um, and then tomography is the lowest resolution technique. Um, it still can give, you know, I would say sub nanometer is a good resolution to aim for, uh, but um, it's not going to give you the highest resolution. And then finally, the 2D crystallog 2D electron crystallography, which used to be give you the highest resolution of all of the modalities, but current, but as you'll as as you'll see, it's sort of gone by the wayside. Um, so 2D crystallography. Um, it was basically the first high resolution cryo EM method. Um, and what it refers to is making a, a 2D crystal, which basically means like a, fat, a flat, arranging your molecules in a flat sheet, a flat ordered sheet or in, in which they're in a regular array. And, and it's 2D because the array is only in 2D. There aren't 3D stacks of these things, of your molecules. There's just one layer of them in a, in a regular in order. Uh, so that's why it's been called 2D crystallography. Um, even though the molecule itself is, is 3D. Um, it was mostly applied, not all 100%, but mostly applied to membrane proteins. Um, so this is a, from a, a review which from about 10 years ago um, and showed all of the high resolution, uh, many of the high resolution structures by solved by 2D crystallography and most of them are membrane proteins. So rhodop bacterial rhodopsin was the first, uh, light harvesting complex, um, aquaporins, various um, transporters uh, and, and, and um, antiporters, and then um, the acetylcholine receptor. So these, these, were all, these are all membrane proteins, obviously, and, and they're sort of naturally, you know, since they're, they're limited, the proteins are limited to the plane of, the, of, a, of a lipid membrane, they're sort of naturally, uh, they're sort of natural targets for, for 2D crystallography, for making 2D crystals. And so in order to make them, what you have to do is you purify a, a membrane protein, usually in, in detergent, and then you add back um, lipid of, of choice, and then you remove the detergent, and then hopefully the, the protein then settles into a lipid bilayer, 
and over time, you know, it might take a week or more, it, it will arrange itself in, into a 2D into a into a 2D crystal inside that lipid bilayer. So in order to remove it, there are several ways. Usually, most of it is using dialysis. So you could use these little dialysis buttons in which you, you put a, a few microliters of your sample into a little tiny little button and then cover it with a dialysis membrane and it would then slowly dialyze out in a, in a much larger volume. Or traditional, if you have a large volume, much larger volume, you could use dialysis tubing. Um, for high throughput screens, uh, dialysis block has been was developed just so that you could screen up to 96 different conditions in one block and have it sort of have it diffuse away. And, and there was even a robot developed for um, using to, to remove detergent using cyclodextran. Um, so this was sort of a, the, the only way to get sort of high higher throughput results. It wasn't really quite high throughput, but higher throughput in order to screen conditions to, to make your to make 2D crystals. But it's quite a bit of work because you don't know, you have a lot of, of space to explore. You have different detergents and different lipids and then different additives. So it, so it could be quite a, lo a lot of work. And then in order to screen for 2D crystals, generally that was done, you do it by negative stain. So you you put your, you'd have your solution of, of 2D crystals and then and then um, put it onto a grid and then just stain it quickly and then put it into the microscope. And then that, that's pretty fast because the insertion and removal of sample, if you do room temperature samples is very quick compared to cryo samples. And you can put a, you can put a lot in and, it, and it's amenable to, to sort of a, an automation where you could, uh, there, there were some, at least two different robots designed so that they could in, insert many samples during a day automatically and do a sort of an automated screen by by um, by regular negative stain EM to look for crystals. And, and there are various things that you would look for. So you'd look for sort of a the appearance of a, a crystalline lattice or 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 just sheets and and, and this in this A um, box there's an image of a crystal crystalline sheet that you would hopefully see. And then but you might I mean, you might see other things like just just regular proteoliposomes where there may or may not be proteins in it or just liposomes you might see if there's too much lipid you might see aggregation or just sort of clumps of things or precipitation but if you see something like this you could ideally do do a little bit of analysis of it and get get kind of a, a 2d view of, of what the protein lattice looks like and what a, a low resolution 2d map like 2d projection map through the protein looks um, for cryoimaging, what you what you do is you you basically put it onto a grid, and then and and freeze it. And quite often, what you do is you put put a solution of um of, of, of like a, a carbohydrate solution of it, a sugar solution on it, and and have it and freeze it, and then have it just sort of be embedded in, in it in it, and then look at it under cryo conditions. And if you look at in and this is sort of an A panel A is sort of a low mag view of a of a of a crystal and then B is a magnified view of part of it. But you can't, you can't, you can sort of see there's something there, but it's hard to see a lattice because the contrast is very low. Um, but then in, if you look at the, the Fourier transform of it, you can you can see diffraction spots. So then it'd be clear that there's a there's, there's a crystal there. And so you should you should you should collect the images of it. Um, in order to see the lattice, you can do a simple, fairly simple Fourier analysis of it where you you would take an, a, an original image of it. And then calculate a Fourier transform, and if there is a um, if there if there is a, a an underlying lattice of it or underlying order, you should see diffraction spots uh, corresponding to the to the lattice spacing. Um, so the, then you would you basically filter out those spots. So you'd only you'd only include those spots and kind of remove the background. And then if you do an inverse Fourier transform, you you could then see you can then see what 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 the underlying lattice and, and structure is. And, and so, so this is sort of, would, would sort of very quickly tell you what, what, what the protein looks like and what the, in, in, in low resolution and what, and what the crystal looks like. Um, what you can also collect are diffraction images as opposed to um, just regular images, but you could actually co collect a diffra electron diffraction pattern directly. Um, and, that, and that gives you much more accurate amplitudes uh, in other words, the, the intensities of these spots are much more accurate. So on the right is of the half 
half of this image is a diffraction image, and, and on the left half is a calculated Fourier transform of, 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 of the same of the same crystal or the same form of crystal. And you can see that the spots are much easier to see. Um, the, the spots are also not affected by the, the CTF, the contrast transfer function of the microscope. So you don't have to worry about correcting for that properly. It's not affected by specimen movement. So if there's any sort of drift in any direction, this was much more of a problem before there were direct detectors and, and motion correction, but um, the, the, any sort of drift or movement will, will blur out the spots if you do the Fourier transform of an image. Whereas if, you, if you're if you looking at the diffraction spots directly, that the, the movement is sort of invisible. You don't see any change because it only it only results in a change in the phases on the spots. And, and this is the other difference. You can't, when you collect a diffraction image, you only collect the intensity of the, of the spots and not the phases, the phase information is lost. Whereas if you collect a, a real image and you calculate the Fourier transform of it, you actually, you have the amplitudes and the phases, but like I said, the amplitudes are less accurate. And so what basically would be done is a sort of a hybrid experiment where you collect some diffraction images to get accurate amplitudes and also collect a lot of real space images to, to, so that you would have the phases as well. Um, so we, during the screening of it, you, you sort of have to screen for what 2D crystals were, are good. And so on, the, on this image, there are panels A, B, C, and D. And, and D, if you can see it well, you can see there are, D shows the best, um, the best diffraction spots of all of them. They, they, you can see them, they're very even and going out all the way. Whereas in A and B, the spots aren't going out very far. And in C, they're, they're only going out far in some directions and in other directions. So A, B, and C would be examples of images which have crystals, but don't, but they aren't good enough to collect on. Whereas D, you would say, okay, this is a, this is a good image. Uh, so you should collect on it. And one, another advantage of collecting diffraction images is that you don't need very much dose. So this would be, you could do this at a very, very low dose and, and get these spots. So you can screen it without really, without burning things up very badly. And it is easy to set up the, the, micro, uh, the electron microscope for diffraction imaging. So this is kind of just a brief view of the electron optics of it. Um, so you have on the left is, is, is the microscope when it's in regular imaging mode. And on the right is when it's in diffraction mode. And, and so in, in regular image mode, you, you have the, your, a sample up here and the beam's going through it and it's getting scattered. By 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 the um, by the by the object that's in the object that's in the in the in the in the in the, in the microscope, and then there's a in the in the in the crossover plane formed by this lens. There's a you have an objective aperture to get rid of any highly scattered highly scattered um, beam, and down here there's an there's the image plane where the image is reformed, and then this is magnified by by a series of projection lenses and eventually collected. And you, know, you can see that the, the, there's all, there, you, you have, you have Im, you part, some of the, the beam goes straight through and then some of it is scattered by the sample. And actually what you, part of what you see, the part of the reason you get contrast is you have the, the interaction of the, the, um, the, the undiffracted beam with the diffracted beam. And that sort of gives you contrast in the imaging, in the imaging plane. Um, for the for when you, when the microscope is in diffraction mode, almost all the microscopes have a little button that just says diffraction. So if you push that, what happens is you you then get a instead of having the projection lenses down here, you 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 have it, it has a different lens with a set of lenses that get activated the diffraction lenses. And so they what they do is they actually instead of putting the Instead of putting the an image of the of the imaging of the instead of putting the real space image onto the onto the detector, it it puts the, um, the an image image of the diffraction plane onto the detector. And so if you have a sample which is which has a regular lattice in the diffraction plane, you'll have an inverse lattice of it. And so that will be what you actually see on the detector will be a series of spots. And then you also have the the direct beam which is going right through. And and most of the most of the beam is going right through the sample and not really interacting with it. So the direct beam is very very strong compared to the diffraction beam. So what you also have to have is a beam stop so that you 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 filter out the direct beam with it so that you don't burn your your detector. Um, generally, also you you don't have an a, you don't have a, an aperture in the objective plane because you want to collect all of the the 
all of the diffraction spots, including the various highest resolution ones, because the quality is going to be, should be very high. Um, you may have a selected area aperture, in, which is down here in the imaging plane. And so the idea of, the, of a selected area aperture is, is that it um, basically filters out regions which are outside of the area of interest. So you might have a, you know, a, a selected area aperture of, of say 10 microns so that you're, you're only looking at a crystal size of, of a maximum of 10 microns because you don't wanna, anything that's outside of the crystal, you don't really need to include um, in to collect these diffraction spots so that you're not really introduced. It's a way of filtering out um, excess noise basically. Um, so as I said, the diffraction data is not affected by stage instabilities like drift and things like that, or beam induced specimen movement. Um, there's no, they're not really affected by the CTF or stigmat image astigmatism. There is diffraction astigmatism, so you have to make sure that, that, that the diffraction mode is, is well aligned. Um, or um, temperature instability is also, it's not really affected by, because these again result in, in specimen movement. But you do only collect the, um, the intensities or the amplitude of, of the image of the spots, you don't get the phase information. And so that, that leads to the, the same sort of phase problem, which is in X-ray crystallography, uh, if you, if, when you collect diffraction data. And so what you do for 2D crystallography is you collect, you have, you collect the images so that you get an idea of what the phases are, and then you collect um, diffraction patterns for the, for the amplitudes, and then you sort of combine them. Um, just as a review of, you probably have this already from your Fourier lectures, but um, for the relative importance of phase and amplitude, like if you if you take one image, if you have two images and you calculate Fourier transforms of each of them, and then from the first image you keep the amplitudes, and from the second image you just keep the phases, and then you make a you the, you then make a hybrid image which has the amplitudes of image one and the phases of image two, and then back and then do an inverse Fourier transform of it, you get this sort of degraded image, but the image, the degraded image is obviously much, you know, very similar to the image two, which has the phases in it and doesn't look at all like image one. And so the reconstituted images are really dominated by the phase information. The amplitude information is important, but it's not essential, whereas the phase information is absolutely essential. Um, now, one other thing for the, for taking these images of 2D crystals is that they're never, the lattices of the 2D crystal, it's, it's never 100% perfect. There's always going to be some bends in it. Um, the, the, the crystal itself might be bent a little bit or the, it landed on a, it, you know, the crystal's lying on, a, on, on, a, on the carbon on an EM grid and there, there may be distortions on the carbon or something like that. So there, you, want, you, you, you needed to remove any sort of lattice distortions uh, from, from, from the 2D image in order to get a good 2D transform of it. And so that was sort of that was done computationally, where you'd do this process called unbending, where you sort of choose a choose a, a region of it which is which is good, and then do cross correlation of that region across the across the whole image, and then you'd you 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 would then figure out where how much different parts of it move and get a sort of distortion map of it, and then you just sort of undistort it computationally and come up with a corrected image, and then you'd sort of have to do this for every, every image you took and, and come up with, have a good reference of it and then sort of unbend it. And then that would, that would also give, that would give you the highest resolution. Now, this also would only give you 2D information. So to get, because, because you're only getting a projection through it. So in order to get 3D information, you have to, you have to tilt the crystal and take a whole bunch of images of tilted crystals and you can tilt up to 60 degrees and then you'd have to you have to merge them because you have to then you have to find the same phase origin so that all of your images can be merged properly and you sort of work your way up where you you take first of all mostly untilted images and then maybe tilt it by 10 degrees or 15 degrees and try and merge them in and then tilt higher and higher um, and, and eventually try to get try to get as much of a, a Fourier space covered as possible um, so this is we show what happens after you merge a whole bunch of different images at different tilts and you sort of be covering as much of Fourier space as you can, but you can still, you know, because of EM limits, uh, you can only tilt to about 60 degrees at most. And in fact, getting a good image at 
a 60 degree tilt is quite challenging. Um, so so you, you, there was, it was quite hard to, to do this sort of work, um, but, but it was possible to do it, but this would be like a fairly long, like years long project in general, you, even once you got 2D crystals. So there are a lot of difficulties in, in 2D crystallography. Um, so screening, you had to set up a lot of conditions, you had to screen them one by one. There were robots to do it, but still there's a large factorial surface to, to look over. So the, the, so it would be, you know, it could be an enormous job, even, you know, and the screening, you know, unlike for say X-ray crystallography, the screening has to be done one by one. So that was kind of made it really di quite difficult. Uh, you also had to get very good crystals that were flat, that lay flat over a large area and were very well ordered. And the, and the merging and the data processing was, was quite difficult. Um, the software, most of it was command line only. So you really had to know what you were doing. Uh, they did make a graphical program called, uh, I Holger Stark made a graphical program called 2DX, which, which, which helped a lot to make it simpler, but still there was a lot to, to, to know and so, and to do, and it was a very long process. So, so for the most part, um, you know, once the, the sort of resolution revolution happened in single particle, when, when the detectors, direct detectors and electron counting were introduced and better software, um, for the most part, 2D crystallography has, was pretty much abandoned apart from um, a special technique called helical analysis, which you'll hear about um, next week. Um, but the, 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 you still have a minimum sample size for, for 2D crystal, for single particle analysis of around, you know, I would say 60 kilodaltons is, seems to be around the limit. Um, but smaller than that is very difficult. Even 60 KD is very difficult to get high resolution of um, just because you can't work, it's hard to order things. So, um, however, um, three crystallographic techniques appeared around the same time as the direct detectors, oddly enough. And so that, that led to a technique called microED for, for microelectron diffraction. And it sort of was built up around the same time um, to, give, to give high resolution structures. Um, and it actually got a sort of runner up for a breakthrough of the year a few years ago in, in, in science um, for, for its application to small molecules. Um, so to get it into micro ED, where you're looking at the fraction of crystals of small, crystal, small 3D crystals instead of 2D crystals, um, it sort of it's, it becomes a very similar experiment as, as in X-ray crystallography. Um, so with X-ray crystallography, you you basically mount a crystal to, and then expose it to an X-ray beam at a defined wavelength and collect diffraction patterns and you rotate the crystal. Uh, and so that up to 300, up to 180 degrees, so you get all of the views of it, and you can then there's very standard software to to um, to solve a crystal structure once you once you do this, as, as you all know. Um, if if you have small proteins that go to very high resolution, there are ab initio methods to to to, to solve it. Otherwise, to solve the phasing problem, there's you can add heavy metals, soak in heavy metals to it to make heavy atom derivatives, or do mat or sad phasing or molecular replacement. So this is you know this has been all well worked out since at least you know really since the you know became big in the 80s. So it's been it's been it's been quite a while for X-ray. Now the main difference between X-ray and EM for in terms of when you do collect crystallographic data. Is the X-ray the wavelength is quite different. So the X-ray, the wavelength of X-rays is 70 or 150 picometers, whereas in EM it's you know four, you know two to four picometers depending on the on the voltage of the microscope. And so, if you remember the sort of Bragg equation, this n lambda equals 2d sine theta, because the idea is that when you have when the rays scattering rays come in and then and then and then scatter from your from your pro, from your centers of from your from your from your 3d lattice they have to be separated if they're if they're in phase with each other which means they're separated by a by an even number of wavelengths and they're in phase so then they they add up coherently and that's where you see the spots so that but the the the, the angle of the of scattering has to, it has to do with the 
a, a sort of an even number of the wavelengths. So you, do, you get much smaller scattering angles from the from the wavelength of, of electrons than you do with with um, the, from X rays. Uh, um, another thing is is this construct called the Ewald sphere, which basically it's like a if you imagine you have a three D you, if you have a 3D crystal and then in Fourier space, you would have a 3D lattice in, in, in Fourier space of it. And, and so if you, if you draw a sphere sort of centered at the origin of your crystal and it, it, it will then, where, wherever that sphere, which has a radius of, of the inverse wavelength of, of, the, um, of, of the radiation that's, that, you're, that you're using to get the, to get the diffraction pattern, it, it, where, wherever it interacts with this sort of 3D lattice, this is where this is sort of where, where the spots that you see. Now, because the wavelength of an electron is so much smaller than the wavelength of an X-ray, the radius is a lot bigger because it's Fourier space. So things that spacing small in real space becomes really large spacing in Fourier space. And so the radius is, is, is really large for electrons of the Ewald sphere, which is and it's large enough that it's that it's almost flat. Um, co co compared to compared to an X-ray diffraction, and so what, how that shows up in the diffraction pattern is, for an X an X-ray diffraction pattern, you kind of you're sort of seeing a projection of of the Ewald sphere on on this 3D lattice, and and so you sort of you can kind of see the curving of it in, in, in on the on the right hand diffraction pattern, whereas on the for, for an X-ray pattern for for an electron diffraction pattern. This is almost flat, so it's almost a pure projection through the lattice. So you don't really see the this sort of effect. Now, sort of this is a good thing for imaging because you, which means you. That's why you normally for have to you normally don't have to correct for the Ewald sphere in imaging until you until you're reaching very high resolution of a, of a large protein. But for diffraction, it kind of makes it more difficult to to index because you only have. A whole, you're, you're collecting, collecting a whole bunch of 2D slices, projections through, through this 3D lattice. It's only drawn as 2D for simplicity, but it's a 3D lattice. And that sort of makes it hard to figure out what the true lattice parameters are. Now, if you, if you have sort of a, a lattice electron diffraction through a thin crystal, this, the diffraction spots are sort of spread out or elongated you know, in the direction of the thin crystal. Because because they're, 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 they're sort of less information here, so they're sort of longer instead of being round, they're, they're elongated. Um, and this the Ewald sphere it sort of interacts with them like this. This is sort of an exaggerated curve. It might actually be a lot less curved than this, but this is an, in, in an exaggerated curve. You you're sort of you what you're collect what you see is is this is the diffraction pattern that what you see and so and what you're actually getting is the diff where this curve is interacting with this lattice. And so there's over here, the <clears throat> on the left-hand side, it's sort of, you're, you're only collecting part of these spots for, for one thing, instead of getting the whole spot because they're so elongated. And you also, um, are you, there's like a little gap here and a gap here because you in this part of the, the diffraction pattern. You're you're getting one layer, and then you're skipping up to another layer here to get this. And so this is these are called Lowy zones. So that when it sort of skips to another layer, you're getting a higher order Lowy zone. So here's a skip here, and there's a skip here. Now this actually helps index the diffraction pattern, but because because it's it's flatter in 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 for electrons than it is for for um, X rays, you get fewer of these, and so it becomes harder to index. These, these 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 sort of Lowy zones actually help the software and index the, the crystal the crystal lattice to figure out what the true the lattice of it is in order and and you need to, to, to know the lattice in order to solve the crystal structure. Now, for X-ray crystallography, you, you you know obviously you have to make 3D crystals, and a lot of proteins don't produce crystals that are large enough for X-ray diffraction experiments. And you can use there's some a newer technique called X-free electron lasers where you have many crystals and you you sort of only you sort of blast through it with an extremely intense beam, but that's a very extensive expensive experiment and, and I would say hard to get time on. So it's a little it's harder to do than, than other techniques. Um, but X 
It, but if you have small, small crystals that are too small for X-ray crystallography, they're still well large enough for, for electron crystallography. And so this was, as I mentioned, this, um, first published in around 2013, where um, from uh, the Gonin lab, where they, where they first of all they they imaged, they they realized they, they their crystals were small enough that they could they could do they could get the fraction images through them, and they and they sort of it did. It, they the first time they did it, they just did a whole bunch of individual tilts, and then and collected a whole bunch, collected a lot of diffraction patterns, and used some in-house scripts and software to to index it, and and eventually we're able to solve um, Liza Zyme at, at two point nine X-ray resolution using a just kind of a standard two hundred kilovolt microscope, so reasonable quality microscope on a on a CMOS detector. Um, now they. The current way to do it is to actually collect with continuous rotation, which makes the the processing a lot easier. So you sort of you you have you have a, you have a camera which has a sort of a roll a rolling shutter mode, which which collects kind of like live movies of it uh, of, of images, and then you 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 just have it you have it collect and have it slowly turn or slowly um, rotate. And, and you collect then this way you collect a whole bunch of images of the crystal you make a whole bunch of movies of it and and you can then um, determine solve a crystal structure of it without you know using kind of once you want to convert it using kind of standard um, x-ray crystallography software um, so the workflow overview for for micro ed is you first of all have to again it's crystallography so you still have to somehow make crystals of it um, it's a little challenging to identify crystals because they're sort of by definition, they're too small to see because they're, they, they're usually, they should be less than half a micron thick and they could be micron in size in the other dimensions, but they'll still be too, too small to see. So they might just show up as a powder or a very, what looks like precipitate, but you, anyway, you put them on, onto a grid and then do do kind of standard freezing using a, a vitrobot or, or perhaps a, a Leica or something where you back blot it, or you, and so that you don't so that the crystals stay on the grid, and then free, freeze a sample using a, li, li, use standard liquid ethane methods, and then kind of look look for what looked like crystals at low mag, and then view it at higher mag and see if you have diffraction. And if you have diffraction, you can collect diffraction data. So in terms of thickness, it was first, you know, they first realized very quickly that anything thicker than around 500 nanometers was unusable. But to sort of quantitate it better, there's a very recent paper, um, just actually just came out last month, um, where they actually kind of had, had, had crystals of, um, I think it was protonese K, and and thin them using a fib, using a focus ion beam to make them a defined thickness, and then calculated reconstructions. You collected data and calculated reconstructions using, using micro ED, and sort of measured where the resolution became, say, unacceptably low, um, or you know, worse than atomic or near atomic resolution. And so it basically, what they found was that the the maximum thickness varied with with the mean free path of the electrons through the through the through the ice and, and protein, and it, it's about you could get up to about two times the mean free path of electrons. And so the the idea of a mean free path is that's how far an electron travels through a sample before it gets scattered once on average. And so for for 120 kV, you can go up to 430 nanometers. At 300 keV, you can you can get up to 640 nanometers because the mean free paths are around 200 nanometers and, and about 320 nanometers for 120 and 300 respectively. So you can, that's about the maximum thickness you can, you can, you can see through for, you, you can see, you can get good electron diffraction through. So if your crystals are larger than that, you can break them up using, you know, physical methods by like pipetting up and down or something like that. And then hopefully you get a little piece of it and then and, and collect micro ED of that. Uh, another way is if your crystal is too big, is you can like 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 they did for this for the paper to um, to to quantify how thick they could go is use a focus ion beam microscope to thin them. Now this I mean this works where basically what you do is you this is an image a focus so a fib 
use a fib SEM. So that's a kind of a dual microscope, which has a focused ion beam, which can kind of use the ion beam to cut through things and also has a scanning electron microscope component and, and it has to have a cryo stage too. So it kind of complicates the experiment quite a bit because you, you now need, in addition to your regular TEM, you need a you need a one you know one to two million dollar fib SEM with cryo stage and and a built and cryo and a capability of doing that. So that adds quite a bit of complication, but it's but it's possible. So what you could what the what you do is you sort of you look at it through a sort of a glancing angle using the focus ion beam. You identify a crystal and then you mill it away, leaving as just kind of a thin wedge of crystal. And then you can you can then put that into the into the TEM. Now this limits things quite a bit because you can only, you know, make at most I would say eight to fifteen of them in a day, so that it, so that kind of really would limit your throughput quite a bit, uh, but it's but it's possible to work. Um, so for the most part, data has been collected on a CMOS camera in this ro sort of rolling mutter rolling shutter mode. Um, at, but you have to make sure that you have all of the metadata that's required for processing. So you need to know that the beams, the beam, we, you need to, when you're processing it, you have to know where the beam center is. That's, that, that's pretty obvious because of the, where the beam stop is, but it may, it may change during the collection if the microscope is, is somewhat unstable. Um, you need to know where the rotation, you need to know what angle and everything you've collected at. And so, if you're using automated software, hopefully that's collected. I know in, in, in Legend on it is, but in other software it may not be. So you have to sort of re record somewhere where what approximately what angle that you, all of the images are taken at, and then also you have to calibrate your um, your microscope so that you know the, the the sample detector difference, and you have to convert it to the right mode. So when you save the data you know, in CryoEM, we usually use this mode called the soft, the a software format called MRC, um, or we use TIFF format. But uh, for crystallography, you usually have to convert it to some other mode, some other format called SMB. Um, again, the the flux is very low, the, so the doses per image is very low, 0.01 to 0.05 electrons per square angstrom per second. So you, you, but you, but the, but then you're trying to collect between, say, minus 60 and 60 degrees. So sort of similar to the with the 2D state, you you do have to collect a whole bunch of different views, and you do have a missing wedge because you can only tilt so high. So what you can do is kind of collect a whole bunch of crystals and then merge them together, um, kind of what like what's done with the 2D, where you collect different ones and merge them together. Um, in, in, in this case, it can be difficult because quite often the, if the crystals are thin, they may have a preferred orientation. So there may be some data that's almost always missing because the crystals are almost always lying in a certain orientation. So that, but that's sample dependent. So there are automated collection methods to do this. So there are serial EM scripts um, that, that have been written by by um, Jason De La Cruz, who, who who's actually in New York, um, it's in it's also in, in Legendon. Um, and she wrote an Anchi Chang uh, wrote an app in Legendon to collect um, data by micro ED. Um, if you buy a if you have Thermo Fisher microscopes like a Glacios or a or a um, Arctica or a or or Creos, you can get a you can get an app. And and a, and a special camera that will that will also help aid you in collection. And then the, I'm sure there are other places that have kind of in-house apps um, to do it too. But the idea is for all of them, you what you do is you have your grid in there with with what you hope are nano crystals on it. You sort of do a low mag screening to to identify where the crystals are, save the crystal coordinates somewhere, and then and then have it automatically collect. Uh, a whole bunch of data overnight on on the on the crystals that you found. So as I said, you have to convert the um, when you collect these movies of it, you have to convert it to a format readable by standard X-ray crystallography packages. Um, I know if you do if you use Legend on, it will actually save it in this M SMV format. Um, I know 
Tamir Gonan's lab has some very has some scripts on their site to convert it to the to convert the data to the right format as well. And you also need to have some sort of configuration file for the camera and the microscope so that you can tell the, the camera length and the wavelength, which, which is basically the voltage and, and where the tilt axis is. Um, the indexing of it is is more challenging than for X-ray, as I said, because partly because the UALT sphere is, is a lot flatter. Um, so there are, but there are techniques to get the 3D index of it where you sort of combine a whole bunch of images and and and, and it can it can then kind of figure it out and kind of work its way up. Um, for phasing, phasing is a big problem because like because you're only collecting image diffraction images and not real space images, you have the problem of, of how to get the phases or how to start with the phases. And so for protein structures, it's just about all done through molecular replacement. Um, in other words, you have a structure of something similar, and then you, you use that as, a, as an initial guess approximation of the phases. And then the software from this initial guess um, you know, go, goes through and 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 it solves what the what the true phases are to get a high resolution map of your true protein, but you have to have something to to do molecular placement on. Um, for small molecules, ab initio phasing works well, but it has to diffract really well to better than one point four angstroms uh, for that to work. But 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 that's but that work that does work for small molecules. Um, that, however, you do have to know how to do all of this too. So that kind of adds to the challenge is that you have, you have to not only then know the EM part, but you have to have someone, either you or a collaborator, to be able to do this sort of more advanced um, phasing of things to solve it. So this is from a, a review from a few years ago now, but for the most part, um, a lot of the proteins that have been solved were sort of solved by other means already. Um, but you know, the, it's quite. It's been it was quite useful for for small peptides and, and things like that that were or small molecules that that had not been solved. Uh, for for larger proteins, um, sort of if, if it was sort of solved already, it was just sort of a, a proof of principle for for a lot of things. There have been some um, novel structures that were solved. Uh, one of the one earlier ones from a couple of years ago was this R2 LOX protein. Um, that was actually solved, collect, the data was actually collected. It was not collected on a FEG. It was actually using a 200 kilovolt uh, lab six microscope. So you don't need the absolute best microscope for it. Um, they used a, this, a sort of hybrid pixel detector, which is kind of made for electron diffraction. And then they, to, to sort of, to solve the structure and, and what it, was this this protein actually formed these plate-like crystals, and then they had a preferred orientation, but they still were able to solve solve it to uh, to quite a, to, to high resolution. Um, more recently, um, uh, again the the Gonin lab they they they're kind of one of the pioneers of this of the technique, um, and they 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 solved the structure of the human adenosine receptor. And it's a membrane protein, but it's a small membrane protein. You can see it's only, I think, I think it's around 40 kilodaltons or something like that. Um, but, and it was solved in the bilayer itself. Um, but they, they actually made crystals of it using um, this, this lipidic cubic phase. Uh, but that was sort of too thick for, 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 for it to blot to, and, and make good, good grids of. So what they had to do is add this sort of, this, uh, in, this other agent to make convert the lipidic cubic phase into a sort of sponge phase and then froze the grids and then did, did even then they were too thick, they, but they then did fib milling to thin the crystals and, and solve the structure to, to, to high, I think it was 2.8 angstrom resolution. And they could actually see uh, four cholesterols bound to it in the, in the bilayer. Um, what probably more exciting or not more exciting, but more commonly useful is for it to use to solve small molecules. By small molecules, it basically means sort of drugs, you know, things that are quite like progesterone or something like that, or, or Tylenol or, or, you know, very small drugs. Um, and the idea is for that, that's quite a bit simpler to, to do. So what you do is you have your, you have it quite often, these small molecules are in a powder already. 
you can kind of grind up the powder on a glass slide and put it onto a grid and remove any of any large pieces of powder so you only leave micro little fragments of it on, on, on the grid itself and then collect diffraction patterns of it uh, using the same technique. Uh, it's quite a bit simpler than than is for the, the than than for proteins because you just basically have your crystal that's sitting on a grid. Um, you, you image it generally under cryo conditions because the microscope set up for cryo, but it doesn't have to be frozen. Um, you don't, you know, you can just be in liquid nitrogen. You don't have to have it in, in water or, or a solution around it. Whereas for a protein, you know, you have, you have a protein crystal that's on a grid and then it's in buffer and then it, it might be thick and you have to worry about the freezing conditions and all that. Uh, it's quite a bit more complicated. Um, this, in the original paper by Jones et al, they sort of solved, I think, 18 structures or something like that. And they sort of, it, you can kind of, these are the, the on the right is the, the, the molecular formula of it. On the left is the actual map that they made using all of them using ab initio phasing. And as you can see, they're all very, you know, pretty much atomic resolution and, and, and you know, solved, solved very well. In a more recent paper, um, by, by Bruin et al. Um, just, um, last year, they they sort of did an overview of it and they they, they solved over 50, they looked at over, about, you know, I think, I guess it was almost 60 samples and over 50 of them were they were able to, to solve using 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 this micro ED method. Um, so it's so it's quite it's quite doable for this. And I think that you know a lot of chemists are are excited by this because then they don't have to try to do x-ray crystallography and make their crystals large enough, they can just use a regular, whatever sample they've made, it's in a powder already, just put it into a, into a cryo electron microscope and then, and then get this, get a, solve, solve the structure of it re reasonably easily. Um, in terms of unique structures solved by micro -ED, this is again from the paper by Brun et al. They sort of did a survey of them and the majority right now are still are small molecules being solved. There are some proteins being solved, but there's not that many unique proteins. A lot of them are sort of standard samples where it's, again, a lot of it is still proof of concept um, to, to sort of solve, solve structures, but it does, it does work. Um, in terms of detectors, most, most of them, most studies are using just are using regular, not direct detectors, but regular CMOS detectors, which have a scintillation layer on them. They do have to have a fast readout range or fast readout time, which, so that you can do this continuous rotation. <clears throat> and so um, this, they have to have this generally have this rolling shutter mode, so that it so that that will work. But but um, and so the, the I guess the main ones that I've seen being used are the TVIPS F416 detector, <clears throat> which is 4K by 4K. There's the CETA detector, which is on most um, Thermo Fisher microscopes, kind of used as a screening one, but it also has a rolling shutter mode. And now Thermo Fisher, since about two years ago, they made a CETA D, which is uh, like the CETA but has a thicker scintillation layer, and it's better for you can get better electron diffraction patterns from it. And in, and in fact, in the paper I brewed it all that they used a C to D, and I think they said they found it was easier to get the, the diffraction data was better than from the from the standard C to camera. Um, there have been some papers where they're using direct detectors for it, and they they also they they are improved. They seem to show improved um, signal over, com, when compared with the C to the standard indirect detector, as you might expect, since it is direct. So this is from a paper from again the Gonin lab. Where they were using a Falcon 3 detector. And this is sort of shows that you can kind of see on the right hand side that the quality of the peak is a little bit sharper for the Falcon 3 than it is for the CETA. And recently I saw um, they gave Tamir going and gave a talk where he was actually using a Falcon 4 detector and 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 collecting in counting mode. So an electron counting mode instead of just the, the regular mode. Um, the regular linear mode and, and, and got another improvement using a Falcon 4 detector. Um, so that so that could be one way to get even better data from for the if if necessary for, for this. But you'd have to be very careful to not to make sure that your beam stop is in the right place because uh, a direct detector would be very quickly burned by the direct beam from a from mic from micro ED data. 
There's also um, been a paper uh, recently um, where they used the DE64, again, for small molecules. They saw <clears throat> biotin and L-serine. But it, it, so, you know, there, there, there are, it is possible to use these direct detectors on it now, but I would say it's a bit, you'd have to really, really know what you're doing because you don't want to, the direct beam is so bright, it would definitely burn the camera if you, if you somehow had the beam stop misaligned or forgot to insert it. Um, there are also hybrid detectors, which are sort of, actually, they're sort of generated from the same type, there's same companies that make a, make detectors for x-ray um, crystallography. And they're, they're sort of, they use a different technology than the direct detectors. They're, they have larger pixels, um, but they, they're, they're also very dose resistant. So you don't have to worry about burning them up. Um, and so these ones also are sort of specialized for, for collecting uh, electron diffraction data. They're generally not good for um, regular imaging data because the, the detector size is pretty small. Generally, they're 256 by 256 pixels, and then they they sort of paste four of them together to make a 1K by 1K image. But that's you know as you it's very small compared to a standard um, high resolution direct detector, which has you know 4K by 4K or more or more pixels. Uh, but they but this is if you're going to do um, a lot of this, you you probably would want to get either you might want to get a specialized detector like this or, or perhaps a C to D, which is made for, for, um, for, direct for um, electron diffraction collection. Um, so sort of in summary for microED, it has, one, it has some, some advantages is that you don't need a, the highest resolution or the highest quality microscope to get atomic resolution data. Uh, you know, 200 kilovolt is, is good. A FEG is better, but not essential. Um, there have been structures solved on a, on a lab six filament. Um, it, it does provide the highest resolution by cryo EM. And the sample prep, if you're gonna do small molecules is fairly simple. You just have to get a powder, powder of your sample and put it onto a grid. Um, but it does have some you know, di disadvantages too, especially compared to, to other techniques. The, the crystals, you have to be able to have crystals of the right size. So they, they have to be thin and small but not too small. Um, the, the, screen, the sample prep for proteins and screening for proteins is difficult. So it certainly is, is a much more difficult technique than, than regular single particle analysis. So, you know, if you, if you have a protein that is amendable to single particle, it would certainly be easier to solve it that way than to try to make crystals of it. Um, if, if you, and, and then if it's making crystals that are too big and you have to do fib milling, that, that complicates things even more. Uh, so that really, I would say, makes it quite a di more difficult technique in general. Um, you do need a high quality camera for this and a stage. So even though the microscope doesn't have to be the best quality, the camera does have to be a very good quality camera. And the chances are the better cameras are going to be on the better microscopes. So, so you, and, and the better stages certainly on, are on the better microscopes. Uh, so, so that does, even though you don't need a good, mic the best microscope, chances are that that's where the equipment is, that they're going to be better set up for it. Um, for proteins, there's this, you, you still have a phasing problem, so you have to do a molecular replacement. Uh, I know there are papers working, on, there are people, there are groups working on other more direct techniques that would work for proteins, but it's, but it's more difficult. And certainly the, the processing requires a, another set of expertise. Um, I, you have to be kind of an x-ray crystallographer to solve it and, and probably a good x-ray crystallographer because the data might be more difficult to solve than, than standard x-ray. Um, if you're interested in, 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 in the technique though, if you have an application for it, these probably, these three papers are quite good. I thought they were very good for, um, you know, to give an overview and, and kind of a protocol for how to do it exactly. So the First one is 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 again by the Denelius and Gonan. It, it's in this. It, it it's 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 in it, they, they sort of have a full protocol for for solving microED of, of proteins, and then this the, re, this paper by Brun et al. Um, it gave a nice overview of of small molecule microED, and then this finally this paper. Uh, gives a protocol in case you needed to use to apply fib milling to to make crystal to your crystalline samples to make good 
good um, good sample, good micro read examples. Um, anyway, thanks. So thanks. I have references at the so more references at the very end, but uh, thanks. If you have any questions. Okay, thank you, Bill. So if you have questions, you can put it in the chat, but I'll start off. So you talked about EM modalities. We have a wide range of targets from small molecules, peptides, proteins, cells, and tissues. Um, so if you were to approach any of these problems, what would your first go-to be? So I guess I gave you multi-faceted question because you have small molecules, peptides, protein cells, and tissues which EM modality would you try first? And that's pretty a broad question. Yeah, yeah, I guess, well, I guess it would depend what you're exactly you're looking at. So if it's a, if it, I was, if I was, if it's a protein, if it's a pure protein that you have and it's say bigger than 60 KD or something like that, or 80 KD, you probably do single particle. Like if you're going to do cryo EM, assuming you can't get crystals of it, you know, but yeah. And then if you're looking inside of cells, you're going to be looking at tomography large things you're going to look, or unique things you're going to be looking where you can't do averaging you probably do tomography and small molecules like if you if someone gave you a powder a chemist had made this thing and they oh i want to know the structure of it and it's in a powder probably this micro ed would would be good if you know how to do it or if you can collect the data um i would probably not go to micro ed for a pr regular protein sample unless there was a special reason like it was I guess a small membrane protein where you had only tiny 3D crystals or what you hope were tiny 3D crystals. So for 2D crystallography or micro ED, would you have a specialized tool for that? Or what is your current balance of use? Between oh, yeah. So, so at least here we've configured, I've configured the Arctica to do, be able to do micro ED. Um, so I, I installed, so we have, we run legend on here. So we, I installed Anchi's app and I've done collected some micro ED series of, of biotin molecules. So I would say on the Ar our Arctica with this, it has a regular CETA camera and, and it, it, it worked to collect data. I'm still in the process of, I haven't really processed it yet, but I collected it. <laughs> um, we, I wouldn't, I would probably be a little bit afraid to use the Creos because I just don't want to mess. I know our Creos has an energy filter. And when you change the alignment of the diffraction, when you change the diffraction alignment, it can change kind of the entrance angle of it into the, into the um, energy filter. So I would be reluctant to mess that up, <laughs> but we, we haven't had too much. We had a couple of people ask for it, but we haven't really collected very much of it. So we touched oh. upon the SEMing uh, samples to thin them down. So yeah. would there be particular use cases in your mind that FIBSEM would become part of this workflow? I guess Tamir's review touched upon like lipidic cubic Lipid, phases. Yeah. Like very soft, but do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I guess that, I, I think it'd be a pretty special technique like that, because I think, I would think if it's sort of too big, you, you might be better off at least it might be easier to, to make it big enough for x-ray, you know, uh, rather than thin it for cryo EM. Uh, but I think uh, this lipidic, you know, I think for, for membrane proteins, again, small membrane proteins that you can't, that are too small for single particle. And, but you could get these lipidic cubic phase crystals. And if they're too small, like kind of like what he did, um, th that would be one application of it. But I think the success rate goes way down because you do then have to then you're, you're then combining, you know, the modality of FIB SEM with, with, with this, with crystallography. So you're limited to, you know, you can only make so many, so many lamella before the, everything gets contaminated inside the SEM. So that becomes challenging. I think you can only make around 15 at most, you know, and I haven't heard of people doing many more than that. So then you'd have 15 crystals to look at per grid. And that would be like, so you'd have a full day of fib milling and then you'd put it into the, I guess you put it in their paper. They sort of said that they, for the high success rate, they had to go pretty much directly from the fib SEM to the Creos. Um, if they, if it sort of sat around for a while, some of the lamella would break, I guess in, in their, in their experience. 
or even if they or if they transported it somewhere, they would break. So it becomes, you know, if you have a low success rate and then you multiply it by a low success rate, it becomes difficult, I think. But uh, I think when you need, if you absolutely need it, it's good that they've proven that it works. We have a question in chat. So I wonder if- Oh, sorry. Can I... mute themselves. Kasahun, can you unmute? Or do you want to ask a question directly? Oh, I see it. Yeah. So, so for small molecules, can you can you explain what you mean by put the powder onto a grid? So that's actually yeah. So that basically that was that, that they sort of describe it very well in, in this Brun et al. paper. But what you do is you you have it in a little powder, like it's in a you know you I just had this purified biotin powder, and then you put it onto a glass slide, and then you put another glass slide on top of it and just grind it up as much as possible, and then you kind of what I did was I just kind of dipped a grid into this sort of fine powder and then tapped off anything visible of it so that there is nothing visible because anything, any of the powder that's, you grind up this fine powder, but anything that's still visible is too big for micro ED anyway. And you also wouldn't want it falling off into the microscope. So I just sort of ground it up and tapped it off and then so that there was nothing visible on it and then put it into the microscope and I could see these tiny, tiny little crystals that were still stuck to it. And I think they're, they're small enough that they're sort of just held on there by like van der Waal forces so that they're just sort of really adhered to it. But you don't have to freeze it, like plunge it into liquid ethane and, and have it in solution or anything like that. But you just sort of like, like and, and I think uh, what I also, I didn't glow discharge the grid. The grid was probably still hydrophobic. So I just dipped it into the, into this little bit of powder and then cleaned it as much as possible, if that makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. I think that's a point that people don't realize that if you can see the crystal, even in a light microscope, it's probably too large for micro yeah. Could you touch upon on methods that people have used to try to, I guess, make crystals smaller? Because it's, it's usually easier to make crystals and identify them in a light microscope and say, I have something, versus grow microcrystals. Yeah, so so besides the fib milling method, what they did was just kind of broke them up mechanically. Like they had these tiny crystals and then just kind of pipetted up and down and kind of tried to squeeze them against the, the, the sort of the back, the you know, the end of the tube or something like that. Um, I guess you could, tr you, I guess any sort of mechanical method that will kind of break, we, what you want to do is kind of break off the little shard of it. It doesn't have to be completely shattered, I think, but as long as you kind of break off a very end piece um, that, 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 that you would then find in the microscope, find on the grid in the microscope, but just kind of anything that will sort of sh break off a tiny piece of it, like pipetting, I think. That's sort of what they did in the... In, uh, I guess that, that can also work for mo if you have mo if problem of mosaicity. So that's another use of it is that if you have a mosaic crystal that you have these different ones that are merged together, you can just break off a little piece of it so that you're only looking at one piece, which is it's even though it was in this inhomogeneous mosaic, if you're looking at this one little piece of it, which is now homogeneous, you can do the structure of that. But again, you're sort of trapped, you're sort of stuck because it's too small to see by eye. By definition, so you still have to you have to sort of have faith that you did it. So that leads into because the crystals are so small to see by eye. How do you know you have the right crystal density on your grid? How do you find them in EM? I think you just have to look. You know, you 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 do this. You know, like a low mag map of it and see. Do I see something that looks like crystals? So you see something that looks like it might be a crystal, and then you go over there and you hit you take a diffraction image of it because it doesn't take too much dose for that. And then if you see a diffraction pattern, then you're happy and you can do it. Um, I guess you don't know, what you don't know is if it's too thick, like if it's at the border of being too thick, that would be the, that would be challenging. Uh, but if as long as it seems to be thin enough and you get a nice diffraction pattern, I think you just, you just collect it. But it's it certainly, it's a lot more challenging to screen, I would say. Okay, any last questions? Otherwise, let's thank Bill for, for coming and lecturing and telling us a little bit more about crystallography and the EM modality that you can use the same TEM for multiple yeah. approaches.
Okay. Actually, I should say one 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 thing is, is I think someone had asked before what re, what resources are there in New York to do this. So there's NYSBC. I know you guys have it set up on your Glacios. I hmm. think you have a C to D, right? Or do you have a C to, C to D? You do have a C to D. So it is at NYSBC. So anyone who's a member can collect there. Like I said, we we have it set up here on the Arctica. We haven't I haven't done it that much yet, but if you want to do it, we're 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 set up for it, and I'd be certainly happy to try it with you. And you know, we can get on quickly. Um, and then um, I think Jason, right at um, at MSKCC, Jason De La Cruz, he's the person who made the Cyril M script for to collect this. And he he was at Janelia before he was there, so I think he worked he worked with Tamir, so he he knows how to do it. And then I'm not sure. I don't know if is Columbia or Rockefeller doing it at all. I'm not sure. Maybe you would know. But anyway, there are three places at least. And you could always go to Tamir himself. Or you go, yes, you could certainly, I, I think I think he's, he's you know, he promotes it very heavily and, you know, he's the one of the main people. So, I mean, he would certainly be someone to ask about it. 